Uh, good morning again. Let me offer a good morning to all of you in our in-person audience, as well as to all of those of you uh, who are joining us uh, by live stream for this public and on the record uh, dis discussion on the topic of Chinese economic coercion. I am Liz Rosenberg. I direct the Energy, Economics, and Security Program here at the Center for New American Security. So this event and a report we're releasing today on this topic highlight an issue which has acquired a real uh, mainstream uh, significance and salience over the last several years. And even in the last several months, it has acquired, uh, attracted additional attention uh, in the media as China has uh, used targeted economic policies to uh, uh, highlight U.S. companies um, uh, in order to advance certain messages and political goals, uh, as has often been the case in the last several months with regard to Taiwan. And it's clear that coercive economic measures are now a fundamental part of China's tools of statecraft and it's the conduct of its foreign policy. So today we're going to take the opportunity to look back at this phenomena over the last decade or so and consider <coughs> what factors inform uh, from this experience China's potential future use of uh, coercive economic statecraft and what this means for United States interests uh, in the years ahead. So I'm very lucky to be joined by a terrific panel here. Uh, immediately to um, my left is uh, Peter Harrell, uh, adjunct senior fellow at the Center for American Security. Next to him is Bonnie Glazer, uh, senior advisor for Asia and director of the China Power Project at CSIS. Uh, beyond her, um, to my further left, is Daniel Dresner, professor of international politics at the Fletcher School of Tufts University. And on the end, Michael Herson, Asia Director at the Eurasia Group. Thank you very much all for being with us today for this conversation. I'm going to ask a series of questions to our panel and we'll have a discussion together uh, for about 35 to 45 minutes. And then I'm going to invite you all to join us in this conversation by asking questions so you can think about good questions now. We'll expect a lively, uh, engaged audience to participate. Um, let me start first with Peter. Um, to help us set the stage on this topic. And could you please describe for us the phenomenon <coughs> of uh, coercive Chinese uh, coercive economic measures uh, and what are some notable cases as we're thinking about this? So we're all on the same page with definitions and terms. Yeah. Uh, and then you can all take us in different directions <laughs> later. But just to start. Yeah, no, thank you. And thanks to all of you for coming uh, out today uh, and for those of you who are watching this on uh, live stream. Uh, just to set the discussion a little bit, um, when we're talking about economic uh, coercion, at least for the purposes of the report that was released today and for the discussion today, we're talking about China's use of economic measures, sort of negative economic measures to advance foreign policy goals. So some of the cases uh, that I think have been in the, uh, quite a bit in the news uh, late, well, not just lately, over the last decade, going back to 2010 with the rare, where China cut off uh, rare earth ex, uh, exports to Japan in the context of a dispute over the Senkaku uh, Islands. More recently, a case that's been in the news quite a bit uh, has been the range of measures that China imposed on uh, South Korea uh, starting about a year and a half ago after South Korea actually moved forward deploying uh, the U.S. THAAD uh, missile defense uh, system where we saw China uh, cut off package tourism uh, to South Korea, begin to use some uh, export, sort of import um, uh, inspection kind of measures to cut off certain imports from South Korea into uh, China and a couple of other measures. There have been other cases. Uh, Taiwan uh, has been going on for quite some time, on and off, with China engaging in uh, economic coercion against Taiwan. Uh, we've also seen uh, China doing this against uh, the Philippines. Uh, potentially, right now, there's an ongoing case, or nascent case, I should say, against uh, Australia. So I think over the last decade, we've really seen quite a bit of uh, growth in this uh, phenomenon and something I think we're likely to see uh, more of uh, going forward. I'll just make a quick note about uh, some of the measures that get uh, used. Um, so when we, and I'm a former sanctions practitioner for the United States uh, government and now um, uh, work on sanctions, uh, sanctions matters. You know, when the U.S. uses economic coercion, sort of sanctions and trade controls are our primary tools, we tend to do so very formally. We put companies on lists. We put governments uh, on lists. We have a fairly clear 
uh, set of regulations uh, that come down. That's not to say it's always 100% clear. You certainly hear from companies that say it's not 100% clear. But by and large, it's a pretty direct and clear uh, way of doing it. That's not really how China uh, does it. Um, they, at a policy rhetorical level, uh, tend to continue to maintain they don't use uh, economic coercion uh, other than pursuant to UN Security Council uh, sanctions programs. It's clearly false. They do use it uh, frequently, uh, but they, they tend to, to have done so using uh, you know, things like popular boycotts where they'll gin up a popular boycott uh, against a product. They sort of turn on and off uh, customs inspections. Uh, they have some sort of informal uh, messaging. They'll give large state-owned enterprises to stop purchasing or start purchasing. Uh, uh, things. Uh, package tourism, as I mentioned, uh, is something that they've been using uh, in a couple of cases where all of a sudden, you know, a, a country that had been quite uh, dependent on Chinese tourism will find a dramatic drop off uh, there. So these are kind of informal uh, mechanisms uh, that they can use uh, in order to uh, sort of advance their coercive uh, agenda. You know, they tend to convey, I mean, it's always clear what they want here. They tend to convey it uh, diplomatically or through the media exactly what they want. But there's not usually a kind of formal legal linkage between the measure uh, imposed and the, the policy goal uh, that is uh, that has changed. One thing to note, we may be seeing a little bit of change of that, uh, where China may be, I think they will always use informal uh, measures, but they are beginning to use formal measures maybe a little bit more uh, they're adopting, likely to adopt this year, a new export control law. It'll be interesting to see if they start using that formally uh, going ahead. Also, in the airlines, uh, sort of as many of you may have seen over the last couple of months, China's mounted this campaign against airlines uh, to get them to start referring to Taiwan, Taiwan as part of China on their websites. That seems to be being done both informally but also through some regulatory mechanisms uh, in, uh, in Beijing. Um, uh, so I think I'll leave it there, just sort of commenting a little bit about what we're talking about and what some of the, the kinds of mechanisms uh, that we've, uh, we've seen over the last uh, seven or eight years. Thanks, Peter. Bonnie, I want to come to you next and to, to further expand the, the landscape here. Uh, so add, add what you want uh, to further uh, push out the picture Peter has painted. And could you also specifically talk about how this set of economic statecraft tools fits in a, a broader suite of China's uh, foreign policy tools? Well, thank you, uh, Liz, and congratulations to all of the authors. It's really a terrific report, so I would commend it uh, to all of you. Uh, it's a topic that uh, many people have looked at, but I really like the focus on um, the economic measures and, and particularly recommendations that you make as to how the U.S. could deal with these challenges going forward. Uh, so from the perspective, as I look at it, how this fits within Chinese foreign policy, it's quite clear that China has prioritized advancing its, uh, its core interests, and uh, China has really not clearly defined what it means as its core interests, except really uh, very, very vaguely. So, you know, we see in the 2011 uh, white paper, for example, that the Chinese uh, issued, where they define core interests as including uh, state sovereignty, uh, national or state security, uh, territorial integrity, uh, even overall social stability. So this is really a very broad definition. I think that China has looked for levers that it can use to protect these uh, core interests. And of course, it has seized on the fact that China has, uh, it, there are, I, I think it's probably about 120 or more countries that have China as its number one trading partner. So uh, market access, of course, access to the, to the Chinese uh, market has been uh, something that the Chinese see that they can use as a lever. Chinese tourists, as Peter mentioned, which going forward will become even more important. I would also mention Chinese students mm -hmm. going abroad that we see now at uh, UC San Diego uh, as being used as a bit of a lever. So this is an area where the Chinese have seen that they have potential influence. Um, Obviously, there are other areas not included in the economic portfolio. If you looked at the South China Sea, you can see Coast Guard maritime militia as an area where the Chinese have seen that they have advantage over the United States. Uh, so this is, um, uh, this is something that the Chinese now, are, they are drawing lessons from each one of these cases. And what this report does very well is outline um, and discuss 
what the cases have been and where China has seen some success. And you can see different levels of success. I would say partial success with Norway, uh, with South Korea, um, probably complete success with Mongolia. <laughs> uh, and, and so every time I think that the Chinese draw a, the conclusion that this has had a positive <coughs> impact, I think, again, they're more likely to use it uh, going forward. So this is something uh, that I think we do have to pay a lot of attention to. The, the last thing that I want to say is really how this is not just a foreign policy issue for China. This is very much also about domestic uh, support for the Communist Party, the legitimacy of the Communist Party. And of course we know that the Chinese have used uh, education, indoctrination on uh, China's uh, for example, sovereignty claims over issues like East China Sea, South China Sea, Taiwan. Uh, and, and that, of course, has created in the Chinese public um, a sense of uh, in indignation uh, that the rest of the world should no longer be threatening China's sovereignty on these issues. And so the Chinese government and party now has to deal with an enormous amount <coughs> of uh, pressure from the public that it did not deal with, uh, it really did not face previously. And, and so I see that the Chinese government is trying to use this issue to mobilize people to support the Communist Party, uh, to view the foreigners as uh, something, as, as a group that essentially threatens uh, 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 Chinese interests. That's useful for the Chinese Communist Party as long as it doesn't get out of control. And uh, so I think that particularly under Xi Jinping, we do see a real integration of the foreign policy objectives and the domestic objectives. And I think that the economic coercion piece of it is a, is a, is a good case study of that. Great. Um, I'm about to ask Dan a question about perceived success or not, but before I do, Bonnie, can I just press you a little yes. further on um, core interest creep, if you will. So <laughs> if uh, China uses some of these economic levers, we've, we're calling them here coercive economic levers, mm -hmm. Other people have, to be fair to the broader discussion about this topic, other people use some slightly different nomenclature. But um, you mentioned some of the uh, particular interests that you see as part of what China's core interests are, upon which it, it uh, pulls a number of levers of uh, statecraft. Uh, where's this, is there creep going on? Where is this, how could core interests be defined even more broadly in the next year and five years as a basis for when these coercive economic measures are used? Well, I don't think that Chinese core interests really exclude anything. <laughs> just as, like just as the Belt and Road has become all of China's external economic activity, after all, now it includes the Polar Silk Road, uh, I believe that China's uh, core interests really do, uh, do not, uh, they, deliberately, they're very deliberately vague. But the priority is still issues that I think pertain to sovereignty. So that's, mm -hmm. it's South China Sea, East China Sea, uh, Taiwan are, are really at the top of that list. And of course, Xinjiang, Tibet, which are which more part of China. Uh, but we could imagine uh, circumstances in which if China's energy interests were under threat, uh, you could see the Middle East rising in importance. Right now, I don't see that as particularly on China's radar. Uh, but the United States connects to all of China's core interests. And I think that's why we will be involved virtually in any situation, not necessarily all, but most of them, that, that chi if the Chinese see that their core interests are threatened. So this has very much become part of US-China competition, in my view. Thank you. Dan, <clears throat> so I, I just mentioned I want to ask you about uh, success. Uh, so a simple question that no doubt will be hard for a social scientist. Uh, um, do these coercive policies work? And uh, generally, how should we judge their success? So why don't you give us some criteria. And uh, we've already heard that we should be thinking about these in the uh, international arena, so uh, the international targets of these measures, as well as the domestic constituency uh, for whom these are also clearly useful uh, in messaging. <laughs> 
Um, so let me give the stock social science answer, which is it depends. Um, and then let me uh, offer a slightly longer elaboration. You know, when, when if you look at any kind of judgment about whether or not sanctions work or not, um, I think there's always sort of three criteria you need to think about. The first is the most direct one, which is does the target actually alter its behavior in response to the pressure? I mean, that's the way we sort of conventionally think about this. Um, and by that standard, I think you can argue that the Chinese economic coercion much like U.S. economic coercion has had a, been a mixed bag. It's worked in some occasions. Um, it has not worked terribly well in other occasions. Um, the fact that China's power is rising, however, gives it a perception that it, I think it, that there's a greater success rate than perhaps has actually been the case. Um, part of that, though, is related to the second point, which is the other way. Another way in which you measure success is: Does it sort of resonate with a larger sort of foreign policy goals? Is, is it integrated within? a grand strategy as, as you would think about it. And this is where you can argue China really is, you know, clearly mm -hmm. trying out elements. And, and I think the report, which by the way, I, I share Bonnie's uh, endorsement, I would strongly recommend reading it. It's, it's one of the best things I've read on this. Um, in that clearly China is engaging in sort of an embryonic strategy over the last 10 years, which is much less embryonic now. I think they're, they're figuring out which tools work and which tools don't. And the, the fact is, is that the, what they're doing with this in, in some ways is sort of socially constructing what their core interests are, not just to foreign populations, but to their domestic populations as well. Um, and as Bonnie said, that core interest thing is an, it, it's an expandable pie, and what you're seeing is it, it expanding to some extent. Um, the third and most important way in which we can think about whether it works is whether or not there's a deterrent effect. You know, a lot of people would argue that, that you know, if you look at what happened with South Korea or Norway, what have you, there were some modest token concessions made by some of these countries, but they weren't significant. But in some ways, that's less important than the fact that what makes China's economic coercion unique, looking at it, is twofold. First, the targets that they pick are harder. Um, generally speaking, sanctions against OECD economies don't work terribly well because these are relatively rich economies and they usually have capabilities of, of coping with them. Um, the fact that they were able to get even modest concessions from South Korea and Norway is in and of itself um, significant. The second difference is that China is doing this completely unilaterally. Um, you know, the United States is not a, a, a wilting wallflower when it comes to the use of economic statecraft by any stretch of the imagination. Um, and it certainly has employed economic sanctions unilaterally. But in recent years, it's been relatively adept at either going to the UN Security Council or going to key partners and allies in terms of trying to make sure that any sort of financial sanction doesn't just get buy-in from the United States, but get buy gets buy-in from uh, key partners. And that's one of the reasons it, it's worked. What China is doing is completely within its own purview. Um, and so as a result, in some ways, that means, it, weirdly enough, that its, its ability to sanction is more credible because it doesn't rely on the kindness of allies necessarily to buy in for this. Um, and so that's uh, relatively significant. And the interesting question is not so much, I, I think there's, there's sort of an arms race going on here in two ways. The first is the degree to which other countries in the region responding to China's economic coercion of neighbors sort of preemptively decides they're not going to cross certain, you know, dashed lines, let's say, um, because they recognize that why, what's worth doing that. We know what, how China will respond. And so even if China doesn't necessarily have a complete success in its initial application, what it can do is sort of, you know, cast a pall over other countries contemplating similar actions. At the same time, it is also worth pointing out that there have been instances in which they've tried economic statecraft and actually had short-term successes that have also led to long-term failures. And I think the rare earth case is the best example of this, where they got what they wanted in the initial application. They got their fishing boat back. They got the fishing boat captain back. But basically, that was a one-time bolt that they were able to shoot. And ever since then, their power in that area has eroded dramatically because, not surprisingly, potential targets have reacted to that. So I think the, the, the real known unknown going forward is not what China can do. It's whether or not the potential targets in the region will react to this by essentially engaging in sort of economic balancing or economic hedging to make sure that they are less vulnerable to this kind of pressure going forward. That's a great um, item there. Put a pin in that. We're coming back, and I want to ask you all about that. But uh, first, I want to come to Michael, who um, has a perspective that is incredibly important uh, to any social science policy pragmatic conversation on this issue, which is to say, 
tell us what it looks like from some of the firms on the front line. So, of course, it's private firms that often uh, have borne the brunt of this exercise of Chinese economic coercion. And uh, looking at some of these cases, can you take us through some of the responses that companies have or uh, otherwise adaptations uh, uh, in the last several years in particular, and then I'm going to ask you later about uh, looking forward and a perception of risk, but looking backwards right now. Sure. Well, you know, just a, another unsolicited plug for the report and the event. It's great timing, and, and it's because... We did not put them up to this. That's area. right. Um, it's great timing because in the private sector context, I think we're in a new era, so to speak, uh, in terms of how private firms deal with these challenges, because... Uh, my perception is if we're talking about companies in the West, in the U.S. and Europe primarily, they are very used to dealing with pressures from Beijing um, on issues like uh, that are more in the economic realm, coercion in terms of uh, forest technology transfer and those kinds of issues. Um, dealing with foreign policy hotspots is fairly new. I think you know you mentioned the uh, growing sensitivity around around Taiwan that has caught up many Western firms. Um, this is the new normal for them. It's a new era, and I say that uh, intentionally. New era, I think it's important to date this also uh, into changes in China's foreign policy. We reached an inflection point, I think, um, last October at the 19th Party Congress where President Xi laid out his new era for China, and a key element of that is a more assertive line on foreign policy, including uh, core interests like Taiwan. That's, of course, a message to the rest of China's system from Xi as well. And so as a result, different parts of the Chinese system pick up on these cues and have been more assertive about issues like the way that foreign firms are describing Taiwan on their website. On their website. Um, so uh, on the whole, I would say basically Western firms are pretty unprepared for this new challenge. And an additional complication is that, to go again back to the Taiwan example, these are communications or websites that are not necessarily within China. It might be the firm's global website. So a China or an Asia Pacific team within a, within a multinational will be sensitive to these issues, but corporate headquarters uh, may not be, and they're being caught up in this. The uh, result, I would say, of the fact that they're so unprepared is that there tends to be an initial response, which is to apologize quickly and very effusively, and that can actually be a mistake. Um, it signals that the firm is willing to abandon its principles very quickly. That can invite actually more coercion, I think, within China, and then it risks domestic blowback within the, the home market as well as uh, host governments, home governments or home uh, public, let's say the U.S. public or the European public, um, you know, is concerned about a Western company abandoning its principles, whether that's Taiwan or the Dalai Lama in, in another recent example. Um, so. There is, uh, I think, room for the companies that are savvy to have a more neutral, artful response on how they adapt to these issues. It's not to say that any single company is going to uh, challenge Beijing on an issue like Taiwan. But I think it's, it's more a, a recognition that when we think about economic coercion, it's not as though there's uh, sort of a red button in Zhongnan High and China's leadership compound that's just they hit the coercion button. As I said, different parts of the system are picking up on these cues. And so uh, there's room for companies at times to figure out where is the pressure coming from? Do they have allies within the system, whether that's uh, you know, part of the central government, joint venture partners, local governments that are able to help them navigate this space? And so I think that's what the more savvy companies are thinking about right now. Um, I would say just as a final response, generally I think Western companies are reluctant to try to involve their, um, their home governments in these approaches. Um, and that's really a concern that um, there's an asymmetry because there's a sense that Beijing is going to care much more about an issue like Taiwan than say the, the U.S. government, although that uh, may be changing with the pushback from the Trump administration on, on the U.S. airlines example. Um, and also just a sense that they have more to lose from, from angering Beijing. They're also very much worried about uh, the, the Chinese public and the netizens uh, in these issues. Um, so uh, that, I think, is a challenge from a public policy perspective. If Western governments are looking to push back on this kind of economic coercion, they're going to have a lot to overcome. They're going to have to demonstrate that...
Um, they are uh, viewing these issues with a lot of attention, with long-term concern, that they will be keeping after these issues as long as Beijing will. And really to demonstrate a, a, a coordinated response that really hasn't been present so far. I was going to ask you about forward-looking risk, but I think you've answered the question. Uh, <laughs> and it sounds pretty bleak. Um, uh, and what you've suggested there also makes it sound like options are quite limited from a public policy perspective uh, and or from a business within business community to, uh, to, to push back or to respond. You use the phrase navigating, uh, navigating the space. So uh, can you just talk a little bit about what navigating the space looks like? And then one other thing, and I would invite you all, the rest of you, to respond to this too. What about uh, Chinese companies or independent Chinese companies? What role do they have? Uh, surely they may feel um, uh, put upon, if you will, by some of these restrictions, uh, even though we've just been talking about foreign companies. That's actually that last point is, is a great one. I don't mean to, to suggest that this is completely bleak, because I think it's still, and Dan made this point, it's an evolving picture. Um, you know, China, to some extent, I think Dan made a great point in terms of short-term victories versus longer-term victories. China's foreign policy toolkit is evolving, and I think with some of these tools of economic coercion, the way I would put it is that China might be successful tactically on a specific foreign policy issue, but will recognize that there are strategic liabilities to this kind of economic coercion, particularly in a country that is worried about its economic dependence on China. This kind of measure, and maybe we're seeing this play out with Australia, um, you know, can, can lead to some very serious questioning. So I think, um, just as I think the Belt and Road Initiative is going to evolve in terms of how <laughs> the central government is going to have to think about what kind of initiative Belt and Road is, what's the balance between narrow foreign policy goals versus a more ambitious sort of open architecture for Belt and Road, those same kind of considerations are going to come into play when it comes to economic coercion. Um, and in terms of navigating, what I mean there is um, thinking about, um, for a company, building relationships at different levels of the Chinese system within Beijing, understanding within the foreign policy establishment where this is coming from, are there other allies within the central government or the party that can help reduce the pressure, understanding uh, what the motivations are because there is an interplay between these foreign policy measures and uh, industrial policy, if you will, in the sense that firms might be more vulnerable to this kind of coercion if there's a domestic Chinese firm that benefits from this coercion or is waiting in the wings. So it's that kind of assessment of looking at building allies or building relationships, building an understanding at different levels of the system, and understanding which points are going to be successful with these different stakeholders when it comes to reducing the pressure on Western firms. And your point about Chinese firms is a really good one. They will also suffer from the blowback that this kind of politicization of economic measures can take. So in some cases, Chinese firms will be, will be allies in trying to reduce the pressure. That's very interesting. Um, can I invite, yeah, the, any of the rest of you to talk about uh, domestic Chinese uh, influencers? Well, I wanted just to c caution against drawing the conclusion that China has seen that its economic coercion uh, failed in the mm -hmm. case of Japan. Mm -hmm. So, first of all, yes, as Dan said, they got them to release the captain. J Japan is an example of a country that is very powerful and has enormous investment in China. Uh, so, other countries saw what the Chinese did to Japan and I think ended up in that category that you talked about of being deterred from going forward uh, with any kind of challenge to uh, uh, to China. So I think this is, as Dan has pointed out, the biggest problem going forward. It's how other, other countries really uh, draw their own lessons. And of course, I, I believe that China is, for the most part, seeing that every case in which it has used uh, this economic pressure has produced some positive outcome for them. Even if it wasn't success in that country, that signal was sent everywhere else. And the second thing that I just wanted to comment on was the, the potential for ambiguity uh, in uh, companies reacting to this kind of pressure. 
And I think we'll see this now, for example, with the airlines, which is a really interesting case. So I think there were 35 airlines that were on the original list. I'm not sure what number we're at now. The last time I looked at it was 26 had already changed their website. Uh, the three American airlines that fly to China have not, and uh, the two Japanese airlines also have not. Uh, so the deadline was May 25th, but we've not yet seen retaliation. And as you point out in your report, uh, when the Chinese threatened retaliation toward companies that uh, sell arms to Taiwan, there was also no follow through. So we'll see whether in this case there are. But look at those websites and see what kinds of changes that they've made. At the end of the day, I wouldn't be surprised if what you see with American websites is that the Chinese language website gets changed, but the English language website does not. Um, alternatively, they can use you know, destination, origin, maybe rather than country. I mean, there's, there's ways of being ambiguous that might be able to address these issues going forward. So it's really not all sort of black and white. Mm -hmm. um, Peter, do you want to pick up on the, uh, uh, this last point? Uh, domestic comments are also um, the airlines in particular is something that we've been working on recently. Yeah, I'll just add um, a, a couple of, of, of comments to it. I mean, when I think about kind of companies' uh, options to respond, we've been talking about, uh, starting with Michael and then Bonnie, we've been talking about sort of how companies can change their policies to appease Beijing, oversimplify a little bit, and that's what we've seen. I do think that over time, to sort of Michael's point about there may be some long-term costs here. And I should say overall, I agree with Bonnie. I think the Chinese see this as successful. I think it's going to continue to be a successful strategy for them. That said, for, for companies uh, where their vulnerability on China is a supply chain vulnerability, you know, really the pressure China would have over a company is the company is buying some good from China, they can obviously engage in diversification of supply chain, building redundancy in supply chains, uh, over time to kind of reduce that vulnerability. Um, for companies where their vulnerability is fundamentally a market access issue, you know, what they're interested in is being able to sell to, you know, billion three, billion four Chinese customers. And I put the airlines in this bucket. What the airlines want is to be able to fly to China and back. Uh, they're not really going to have a lot of kind of diversification options. I mean, they're really going to have an option of uh, either stand firm and bear with the consequences, uh, maybe with some you know U.S. government backing, uh, or they're going to have an option of whether directly or with some sort of, I think you're right, Bonnie, they're going to muddle through and try and wait for the, the public attention to pass and then change Chinese language websites and things like that. That's, that's really kind of the option they, they have. So I, I think that you know, given the increase in growth in China, for, for a lot of companies, we're only going to see more kind of vulnerability uh, to Chinese uh, coercion going forward. On the kind of issue of the domestic politics, I just want to echo what, what, what Michael uh, said. We've definitely seen the Chinese across these cases uh, look strategically at tools that give them a twofer of a domestic economic benefit and a foreign policy mm -hmm. benefit. So if you look at the rare earths case, the Japan case, they'd actually, China had actually begun to move towards an export restriction uh, on rare earths as part of their industrial policy to promote domestic manufacturing in China prior, a few months prior to uh, it kind of blowing up with the, 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 the ship, the, the maritime dispute. Uh, and it was after the maritime dispute that they really started enforcing it. Uh, likewise with South Korea, you know, a couple of the measures they took, you know, jumping forward to 2017, were things that very clearly benefited Chinese companies. So one of the measures they took was to, you know, start um, basically slowing down the import of South Korean uh, cosmetics. Uh, meanwhile, uh, you saw Chinese firms uh, move to market uh, aggressively, uh, Chinese-made cosmetics, including one of them by hiring a South Korean uh, actress to serve as their spokesperson as a, as a, as a a Chinese marketer of, uh, of, of cosmetics. And likewise, notably, you saw, you know, one of the measures they took in South Korea, they shut down Lotte, a big South Korean department store, about 90 uh, stores that Lotte had in, uh, in China. I mean, that was a very easy kind of benefit to Chinese uh, department stores. So I think they've gotten quite strategic about how do they find these tools that give them an economic benefit as well as a foreign policy uh, benefit. Thank you. I'm going to uh, come to you, Dan, to go further into the question you started on when, uh, uh, previously, uh, which is to say uh, a response, <laughs> a public policy response, uh, uh, and, uh, and or a response from entities in the region. So 
talk to us a little bit about uh, options here, and uh, and then I would like to ask the rest of you to comment uh, on this as well. We've got a lot of former U.S. government experience on this panel, so people who are accustomed to thinking of um, options papers and uh, briefing memos, and uh, put your Put yourself into that position for a moment and think of the best good advice we might give to the current administration coping with an array of China challenges. Dan, lead us off. So there are three things I would suggest. Um, the, the first is, is that in some ways you, you, can, you can divide the basket of, of sort of Chinese economic coercion tools into first threatening uh, th its ability to threat as a source of supply. And as, as Peter said, and I think this is the area where I think the response by the rest of the world has probably been furthest along, which is to recognize, okay, they might actually be able to do this. We need to make sure we can hedge and so on and so forth. We saw that on rare earths. And I think that's actually their weakest economic tool. And I also think they have realized that potentially as well. So I don't ex the, the irony is, is that, as people point out, they're actually imposing this export control law as a way of sort of trying to legalize this. I think the paradox is, is that it's also going to be the instrument that they use the least um, because it's not going to work terribly well. Um, the second, you know, the more, the more powerful source of its leverage is as a source of demand. Um, the fact that Western firms and, and uh, you know, desperately want to do business in China and want Chinese, you know, uh, business with them, that's the, the much greater power um, of their leverage. And the, it's going to be tough to find alternatives to that. Um, but I do think that, that, and I applaud the report for pointing this out, I think one of the things that you need to start seeing is essentially a, a political risk plan in place for when they decide, you know, to target a specific firm, um, you know, as a way of, of sending a message to the target country. Um, and that's, you know, certainly the case where uh, I think uh, better coordination uh, would be appropriate. Um, the third, and I got to address the elephant in the room here, um, Henry Farrell and Marty Finnemore have this great concept called hypocritical power. Um, that they talked about in foreign affairs a couple of years ago. And there's this notion that, you know, when you are a leader, one of the things you potentially have the ability to do is to articulate norms that you want other countries to adhere to, even as you are covertly not necessarily complying with them. Um, and that can potentially work because your allies might, not, might know that you're doing this, but they'll live with it because they recognize the broader gain. The problem is, is if you actually do something that's so blatant that you get called out on it. And the example that, that they offered was the Snowden, you know, revelations, which forced countries like Germany and Brazil to say, look, we, you know, we're not going to participate in the charade anymore, and it resulted in significant negative blowback for, for U.S. foreign policy. It is somewhat difficult for the United States to go forward talking about promoting a rules-based international order and how China is violating these rules if it's sacrificing all of its hypocritical power by declaring countries like, I don't know, Canada as apparently a mortal enemy that has to be dealt with. Thank you for bringing us there. <laughs> so, you know, so, so here's the problem. As mu you know, we're, we're talking about China's use of, of course, of economic statecraft. That is obviously a concern. And I don't mean to dismiss it. That certainly should be t taken care of. On the other hand, for countries that are going to be the likely targets of this, namely countries in the Pacific Rim and the European Union um, and potentially Canada, they're going to look at that and not like it, but the question is, what's the alternative for them? And if the alternative for them is dealing with Section 301 and Section 232 cases, well, guess what? That, that's suddenly going to make coordination against China that much more difficult. Um, so my, my final recommendation would be that we stop shooting ourselves in our foot. Um, because that would really be a great way of moving forward in terms of coping with this. <laughs> okay, so Dan, Dan with the do no harm line. All right, so um, I'm just going to put you on the spot next, Michael. So uh, you are, say, the um, U.S. Treasury attaché to China once again. Uh, what's your plan? Well, no, no one, I think, would listen to me in that role of <laughs> an, an, argument, an argument like Dan's, which is really at the level of, frankly, the cabinet and the president, but I mean, he's absolutely right. I mean, that kind of coordination, both within the U.S. government and broadly with like-minded countries is just, it's absolutely critical, not only in terms of influencing the way that the Chinese government views the effectiveness and the pushback of these measures, but also for companies who are going to want to have a sense that there is a coordinated response. And I think if you look at the challenges that the administration is having in terms of how it defines its economic policy, and it's really split the business community, that makes it very difficult to, um, I think, to, to 
you know, to, to reassure the, the companies that they can feel comfortable coming forward with these concerns because ultimately the companies are in the line of fire. So I think absolutely coordination uh, and demonstrating you know, long-term thinking and maybe developing tools, new policy tools to address these issues is, is part of it. Um, what I think is interesting, it's not necessarily a recommendation, but what I think is fascinating in terms of where we are right now is the discussion maybe at an early stage of whether or not the U.S. government needs to take a more interventionist approach in terms of how it becomes involved when co individual companies face these issues. Mm -hmm. And the Trump administration's pushback on Taiwan might be an example. The, the, the corollary here is with the Section 301 report where the U.S. government has uh, sort of implicitly um, articulated a view that if you leave some of these decisions up to individual companies, they will make decisions because of the greater power and leverage on the Chinese side that ultimately undermine U.S. interests. So it would be interesting to see if the U.S. government decides to take a more interventionist approach and says there needs to be a more muscular role for the government, even if private companies in the U.S. don't like that. Uh, that's, I think, a legitimate question to ask, but you know, it will raise a lot of concerns among private companies. And the last thing that private companies want is a sense that the U.S. administration would be looking to put them in the middle of a dispute for domestic policy reasons. They want to stay. They don't want to be the next political hot potato, but the last thing they want is a sense that this is not really long-term thinking and it's short-term considerations that the companies are going to have to bear the, the cost of. I can't help but comment that uh, if, like myself and Peter, anyone has come from the discipline of imposition of U.S. economic sanctions, these themes are well-worn themes. Uh, and so it's, uh, it's very interesting and important to see them uh, brought forward into conversations uh, in other business constituencies and in other regional policy constituencies and in strategic thinking constituencies. Let me give the two of you a, uh, an opportunity to respond to the um, U.S. muscular approach or not. Uh, and then I'm going to turn to the audience for some questions. You can think about them, and we'll have someone with a mic coming around after we hear from the two of you. So my policy recommendations uh, would be the following. Uh, the first is to name and shame. And it is remarkable how the United States, in many of these cases that you discuss in the report, most of them, uh, has not taken a position, has not publicly criticized these activities. I, I could be wrong, but I think even in the case of our ally South Korea, that I believe that there was no very explicit statement that came out of the administration saying this behavior of the way latte is being treated, the way Chinese tourists are being prevented now from traveling to South Korea, that this is unacceptable behavior. So when did we say something? When our airlines were involved, and that was the statement that came out of the White House which uh, accused uh, or say, essentially described China's action as Orwellian nonsense. Uh, so a very unusual, unconventional <laughs> response, but why not a, uh, a reaction uh, in, in these other cases? And of course, we should not only do this ourselves, but we should be doing this in coordination with our allies. So why not a statement at the G7? Uh, calling out this kind of <laughs> behavior. Maybe we'd sign it? I don't know. Uh, but uh, I think The G6 is all over that. that right, the G6 <laughs> is all over it. But I think um, getting other countries to state their concerns as well, I think, would be important. Uh, the next thing that I would uh, recommend, of course, is that we try to help, to the extent possible, other uh, countries reduce their dependence on China economically. This is very hard. Um, we know this. Uh, obviously, the United States is working with Japan, for example, to develop more uh, like alternative financing for infrastructure in various countries in the Indo-Pacific. That's sort of one small uh, example. Uh, but this is something that we should be prioritizing. It will be very difficult in the case of Taiwan. Uh, we all know how, I think it's about 40% of Taiwan's exports go to mainland Hong Kong and, uh, and Macau. Uh, Tsai Ing-wen, to give her credit, is trying to promote this new southbound policy, uh, which has actually seen some early results, but reducing economic dependence on Taiwan is very hard, I mean, on, on China. Um, third, I think something that you, that you mentioned in your report is 
uh, encouraging countries to have more uh, visa-free arrangements. And we saw this in the case of Taiwan. Actually, when China started cutting off the group tourists going to Taiwan, they very quickly arranged more visa-free, uh, visa waiver uh, opportunities with uh, various countries. And that has not completely closed the gap. But as you note in your report, uh, there has been a significant uptick in, uh, in tourism uh, to Taiwan. The last thing that I'll say is the hardest but the most important, and that is essentially rerouting supply chains. It's giving companies uh, the incentives uh, to operate elsewhere, to, to go invest in Southeast Asia, other countries, and to try and be less dependent on, uh, on China's, uh, uh, as, as a source of uh, manufacturing. If we can reduce China's leverage, um, and I, uh, earlier it was discussed about how much percentage of steel and semiconductors and all of that uh, that, uh, that China has uh, control of. If we can reduce that, then I think that that will limit the amount of leverage China has going forward. But that will take time. Uh, just to pick up very briefly on a couple of Bonnie's points, and I won't belabor them because I think Bonnie uh, gave a terrific uh, explanation of them. Uh, first, as she, as she suggests, I do think you need to respond very forcefully. I mean, actually, if you look back at the cases uh, we had looked at in the report, the one that the U.S. responded very forcefully to is a rare earth case, where actually the Department of Defense worked in quite close coordination uh, with the Japanese uh, government to try to diversify, identify other supplies. Uh, you saw the U.S. Uh, join Japan and, and also got the European Union on board with an ultimately successful WTO challenge against uh, the rare earth exports. And you kind of saw China... Um, I think adapt to that. I do think they see that as successful, but China, like in the end, I think sees that also downside costs there, and they've clearly learned from that, uh, and I think that, that we were able to push back quite forcefully uh, on it. In the other cases, just to echo what, what Bonnie said, uh, the U.S. basically had a quite muted response. Even in South Korea, I mean, we did interviews on this, I won't betray confidences, uh, the U.S. government did raise it, uh, obviously in Beijing, but not at a very senior level not and not publicly. So. Right. Um, I think that the, the Chinese take on that, the Chinese understand how to read what the U.S. government cares about, and if you're just sort of having, you know, third secretaries raise something uh, in a private meeting, they understand we don't care uh, all that much about it. Uh, um, and so I think you need a very forceful uh, and public uh, and public response uh, if you if you you want to begin um, pushing back. And uh, taking sort of Michael's uh, comment uh, in place. Yeah, companies hate to be squeezed uh, in the middle, uh, and they don't want to be squeezed in the middle, and I completely sympathize with American companies on that. On the other hand, if uh, at a U.S. government level and a U.S. policy level, the uh, U.S. wants to push back, they're going to have to squeeze companies a little bit in the middle, because otherwise, uh, you know, if a company doesn't feel some pressure uh, from the U.S. side, I do think they're, they're simply, for very logical business reasons, going to go ahead and comply uh, with... Um, uh, with the, the, the Chinese uh, Chinese demands, you know, frankly, much the way uh, European companies end up complying with American sanctions uh, demands. I mean, I think there's sort of a, a parallelism uh, there uh, that would be interesting to explore at some point. Thank you. Okay, we're going to uh, shift to some questions from the audience. I uh, expect you all to be lively. It looks like we have a good start here. Mel Ladi, uh, yes, uh, is here with the microphone. So uh, let's start with um, a question. Uh, we'll start right in the front, and then we'll go to the gentleman in white. Uh, thank you, reporter from Voice of America. I have a question for uh, Mr. Harrell, if I get your name right. Uh, you, re you mentioned in your speech that the difference between the U.S. coercive measures and Chinese coercive measures, Chinese is more informal and U.S. is formal. So my question is, why China choose this informal way? Because it gives them, what kind of advantage the approach give it, give it to them? Thank you. You start. Um, yeah, no, abs absolutely. Um, uh, I think there are uh, a couple of reasons China does it uh, informally. I mean, first of all, I think it is kind of consistent with how they for a number of years now have managed their own domestic economy. I mean, for, for the last couple of decades, this is beginning to change where China is moving towards more formal domestic regulatory regimes. But they have a long history kind of domestically of informal regulations. And so I think it's kind of consistent with what they uh, what they. Uh, have done and is something they're familiar with. Um, but I think kind of 
in terms of specific advantages it gives them, because I think now they are thinking about this, do we want to go do things formally or informally, I think they see um, a couple of advantages. First of all, uh, as I said in my remarks, at a, at a public level, a public policy, rhetorical, declaratory policy level, China tends to uh, continue to maintain it, does not engage in economic sanctions outside of the uh, context of UN Security Council sanctions programs. Uh, and by doing things informally, it gives them a little bit of plausible deniability on that. Kind of everybody knows what they're doing, but given that it's not a formal regulation, you know, they can continue to adhere to this sort of we don't sanction countries at a, at a policy level. I also think they uh, like the way it gives them uh, optionality in increasing and decreasing uh, pressure. You know, so for example, they can, you know, put measures in play. They can kind of ramp them up and off, and and then ramp them back down, without uh, having to worry about whether they've achieved exactly what they wanted. Right. So you can put some measures in South Korea. You get some partial concessions. If that had been a formal, if they'd been some very formal public declared messages, I think Beijing would have had to wrestle with: Have we achieved enough or not? They, because they're not formal, they don't have to wrestle with that. We got, now they can think we got enough out of the that of the South Koreans. We can kind of ratchet it back quietly domestically without losing face uh, to our domestic uh, audience. So I think it gives them a lot of optionality um, around uh, around uh, how to do it, which they see as an advantage. Did you want to add something, Dan? Before uh, just a second, what Peter said. I, I wouldn't even call them. I don't. I like calling China's economic statecraft not informal, but rather passive aggressive. Um, which is to say they will totally deny sanctioning you, you know, even though you've done bad things and if you fix them, maybe that would actually solve the problem. And I particularly love the, the phenomenon of where top Beijing officials will completely deny that there's any economic coercion taking place. But when you go down to the lower level, they'll be completely blunt yeah. about, oh, yeah, you know, what are you talking about? Of course, right. Um, it's, it's a great thing. I think the, the, the additional advantage for them is not just that it reduces audience costs within China, but it also has the potential to reduce audience costs within the target. Um, by denying that they're not necessarily imposing sanctions, it also, and this is, I have to wonder if this is one of the reasons why on occasion the U.S. hasn't brought these cases up when allies have been sanctioned, that it's possible the allies themselves don't want it brought up um, because it allows them to potentially make a token concession without worrying about the blowback because it hasn't been a publicized, you know, it hasn't been a formal sort of sanction. So I think that's another um, potential advantage. And frankly, the other advantage that allows China in contrast to the United States, is that it allows them to lift the sanctions without much in the way of, of bureaucratic or legal impediments, uh, which has been definitely a problem in terms of U.S. economic statecraft. That's an understatement. Yes, to the gentleman here. Yeah. Thanks. I'm um, Marty Weiss at the Congressional Research Service. So we've talked a lot about trade policy, but we haven't really discussed much of China's financial statecraft or its efforts at the multilaterals, the IMF, the World Bank, uh, not to mention its you know, bilateral investment treaties that it's signing up all over the place. So one, why is that? Should we be a little bit more focused on it? Um, you know, the World Bank China is increasing its, its quota share. It's, I mean, it's, got, it's, got, it's, getting, it's getting a huge bump in capital. It's now the RMB is now you know, in the SDR basket. Um, and you're starting to see their policy priorities becoming more, you know, there's the formal side, but then there's also the informal and their policy, their policy prerogatives at these institutions uh, is increasing and their, you know, the level of staffing and whatnot. So is this something that you should be concerned about a little bit? What could we be doing? Uh, you know, any way to get more ADB funding for Belt and Road type projects rather than uh, a and IB or China Investment Bank? Thank you. Trying to start? Uh, I'm sure I'm happy to weigh in. I think the, well, I mean, the discussion is we've been somewhat more focused on sticks. A lot of that financial diplomacy is more carrots, which is also very important to talk about. I tend to think of the financial uh, statecraft as being um, part of the tension within China's system about narrow foreign policy goals versus more ambitious, a more ambitious objective of being part of the international architecture. And that's really where the financial statecraft comes in. Because if you think about uh, the role of renminbi in the international system, that's really about China wanting to be you know, a key part of the architecture. And short-term measures that might penalize partners will backfire. So you could look at uh, AIB, the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank, as an example of how this tension can, can play out or evolve. AIB, I think, could have been a relatively low standard, unambitious effort to really increase China's soft power by you know, shoveling loans out the door. Instead, the, and it, depend, it was somewhat because of who 
uh, took control of AIB, but under Jin Li Chun and under the, the leadership, it became much more of a high ambition exercise. So I think when we think about financial statecraft, we frankly haven't seen at the macro level this really used as a tool. I mean, for example, I've often thought it was unrealistic to think that China might sell treasuries to punish the US or to intentionally depreciate the currency because the blowback would be so great, including it would really send a message to all countries about the risks of becoming financially dependent on China. So I tend to think that that's, when it comes to financial statecraft, it's the higher ambition uh, uh, goal of being part of the architecture that wins out as China looks at the costs and benefits of the tools that it has at its disposal. Yes, two fingers down. Yep. Uh, so I'd say two things. First, just to double down on that, this is where, in fact, China's use of, of economic coercion potentially hurts it, which is if it wants to engage in a more ambitious sort of redrawing of the system, sort of redrawing of rules that are clearly more China-friendly, this is where the fact that China has acted unilaterally in these areas is going to cause much higher levels of friction than I think they otherwise would have potentially created. And it'll be interesting to see that play out going forward. The second thing is, is I would say that there's another element of, of China's economic statecraft that will be worth watching going forward, not just the coercion side, but even on the multi, on the, the finance side. China has basically developed, China's learning to form shop, to put it bluntly. Um, because, and, and this is remarkable because 10 years ago there weren't any fora for it to shop. Um, but what it's been doing over the last 10 years and relatively adroitly is creating the AIB, the New Development Bank, and also BRI. And in some ways BRI is to the finance side what China's economic coercion is on the trade side, which is I think BRI took even China's allies by surprise in terms of the relative speed and scope with which credit got channeled through that mechanism as opposed to other mechanisms. And it'll be interesting to see going forward the degree to which they, you know, play off, you know, they, they try to make sure that BRI works through these multilateral forces so they can claim that they're being a responsible stakeholder. And I think, that, among other things, that's the, the latest SCO announcement is an example of that as well, by the way. Thank you. Okay. We'll take some questions uh, over here. Yep. Thanks. Um, Martin Skold uh, just finished a uh, PhD in international relations, actually. Um, I'm going to ask the <laughs> <laughs> yes, thank you. Um, going to ask the uh, panel to speculate a little bit. Um, we've been talking uh, a little bit about instances where discourse was affected by this, uh, even if it's as simple as uh, whether you call Taiwan a country or not. Uh, also, instances of Chinese students essentially having pressure put on them in the United States. Um, it goes without saying, and we take it for granted, almost all of our public discourse in this country or even in the entire Western world goes through private sector fora, whether it's social media or even just journalistic outlets, all of which are theoretically subject to the same sort of economic pressures that are put on other corporations as well. I guess I have to ask, if you were to look 10 years out or 15 years out, what does, and even as we look at, for example, the recriminations uh, of the 2016 election to address the elephant in the room. If you look 10 years out or 15 years out, what does public discourse in the West look like when a lot of the fora for it are potentially subject to this? I'm gonna is there something to be concerned about or is this not something to be concerned about? I love this question, but I'm going to, um, if I uh, take the privilege as moderator to pull back the, the forward look even to um, two and three years. Uh, Bonnie, why don't you leave us off? So I was going to say that I really see Taiwan as a test bed for many of the policies uh, China is, is using. We see this in the cyber realm, for example, and we really see this in the social media realm. And so we don't see, I don't think, China manipulating social media here in the United States the way we saw Russia do during the elections. But this is not 10 or 15 years off. Uh, and I know that the government in Taiwan is very concerned about the co-optation of various social media, introduction of fake news, and because it's such a, a, a polarized polity, um, it's very difficult for the government in power to just say, well, that's fake news, when the opposition essentially says, oh, no, it must be true. Uh, and so they're trying to get uh, some control over this, and, and, and I think it will... If the Chinese address, assess that this is successful, we will see it used elsewhere. 
Um, and I don't think it will take that long before it is potentially used here. Anyone else? Uh, let me just tell an anecdote, which is uh, this is this is changing. I was struck by this. I've taught Chinese students at Fletcher now for for decades. Um, this past fall, I was talking about economic statecraft, and I was giving an example. I was talking about China and Taiwan, the use of China's use of interdependence, or asymmetric dependence, to actually uh, pressure Taiwan. And I was stunned because I had a, a, a Chinese national student vociferously object to the fact that I said the word Taiwan, and that I was treating this as if Taiwan was an independent country. Sure, um, but this is the first time I've ever I've ever had a student protest this, and I couldn't figure out. What, I, it was literally a sort of dis, incommensurate language because she somehow seemed to be implying that because I, as a professor, said this, that I it was like an official imprimatur or something, and I, I would you know I had to really push back vigorously on this. And I, I do wonder going forward whether this is going to be a problem in terms of teaching Chinese students. Uh, whether this kind of, of, of language issue comes up, I would be fascinated to see, because I'm not taking that example out. Um, you know, and so it'll be interesting to see. Oh, no, God, no. Are you kidding? Um, you know, so it'll be fascinating to see whether this happens going forward. That said, on, in terms of the, the social media and stuff, it's worth remembering that there are a fair number of companies that are excluded or don't have large uh, Chinese uh, marketplaces. So I'm not sure that coercive effect is going to matter. Um, and in terms of the fake news stuff, I think that's going to, that always will resonate more in terms of domestic politics rather than in, in terms of foreign policy. So I, I'm not as concerned about it. I guess. You know, despite the fact that Twitter is blocked in China, there is a huge number of Chinese. On yeah, yeah. Did you want to say something? Yeah, I'll just add, add a, a, a quick point or two. So first, coming on uh, on Taiwan, uh, one of the things, and I, I went to Taiwan as part of the research for this um, project. One of the things the Taiwanese are quite worried about, uh, as Bonnie said, is the Chinese influence over the media. And they're worried both about kind of direct, you know, Chinese, um, you know, subterfuge on social media and things like that. They're also quite worried that earlier this year, uh, although our report mostly talked about the coercive side of what China does, earlier this year China actually offered a bunch of inducements uh, to Taiwan. Uh, and one of the inducements that China offered was um, very liberal uh, access for Taiwanese media uh, in uh, China, which is very appealing for Taiwanese media from a market perspective. You've got 23 million Chinese, uh, ta Taiwanese. You've got more than a billion Chinese, so it's a huge market. And the, the, the Taiwan government is very worried about, it. I think, exactly what you're hitting on, which is five years from now, if most of the major media outlets in Taipei are you know, getting 70% of their revenue uh, out of uh, mainland China, what exactly are they going to be willing to publish? And I, th I think that for them is a legitimate, uh, legitimate concern. I, I kind of agree with Dan on the, the U.S. Uh, side. I think for you know, the U.S., given how vibrant our media, we have a lot of problems in our media <laughs> debate here and our media landscape here, but given how vibrant it is and given the Chinese have kept a number of the largest platforms out of China, I do think it's probably a long-term issue uh, if it is an issue for us. Thank you. Okay. Um, right next to you, Eduardo. One of our Hi. own. Eduardo Sarvala, Center for New American Security. I, I was wondering. Co author of the report. Oh. <laughs> I was wondering if you could talk about a bit. We've heard China is the top trading partner of 130 countries, has primacy in all sorts of sectors, but it clearly doesn't target every sector in an affected country. It hits very specific sectors. So I was wondering whether you could talk about how it chooses its sectors or targets within a country, how it chooses not to target ones, and if there's any lessons to be drawn from this for a U.S. response. Michael, can I start with you? What do you what do you say to uh, companies that that you uh, engage with who are who are wonder, wondering about just this question? Uh, I mean, it's a, it's a great question. It comes into play also with not just economic coercion in the foreign policy sense, but also just tightening screws uh, in other ways. Um, I mean, I think your report looked at it more systematically. I do think it's a, a you know something of a hierarchy in terms of. Um, looking at where the leverage is going to be highest in terms of the political constituencies um, in the home government. So, you know, an example with that slightly out of context would be for the, you know, Section 301 dispute, China clearly targeting um, U.S. products that they think are, you know, make uh, President Trump and the GOP vulnerable, uh, in particular agricultural exports. Um, I think there can often be consideration of which domestic Chinese companies might stand to, to benefit from having a, a foreign competitor taken out of the market. Um, 
that might have been an example of when China rolled out cybersecurity regulations in the financial sector. Uh, a lot of Chinese IT companies benefited from the uh, the hit that U.S. technology firms uh, took. Um, and then there's just a sense of you know I think a consideration of whether or not there's domestic, uh, not domestic, but the broader blowback to China's interests. So, in the example of um, financial statecraft. I mean, I can't tell you how many times we get asked if China is going to sell treasuries to hurt the U.S. Um, it, that this, this pops up every couple of months. And, you know, I'm, I'm willing to be surprised. I hope I'm not. But, you know, my response typically is I just don't see that happening because then you've, you've got objectives on the Chinese side that would limit the use of that tool um, and institutionally within China, you know, some stakeholders that will fight vigorously against weaponizing Part of the you know the the system that they view should not be that they, they think should not be weaponized. So it's a, a hierarchy of concerns, but there may be a more systematic way of, of putting it. I'd like to add to this because I think um, I'd like to make a, a really a broader point that the Chinese don't only target economic measures. And if you look at all of these cases, mm -hmm. you will see that that's one set of measures that they use in their toolbox. It's usually combined with political measures. And sometimes what is more effective is the political pressure rather than the economic pressure. And the best example of that is Norway. So when Leo Siavor mm -hmm. received the, uh, the Nobel uh, Peace, Peace Prize, was awarded it, uh, and the Chinese essentially targeted the import of Norwegian salmon. And as you note in the report, uh, the Norwegian exporters were successful at being able to route the salmon through third countries, essentially. So if you look at the exports to, uh, to China, they really remain about the same or, or I think even yeah. increase. But what happened was that Norway got frozen out of discussion with China on a large number of issues. And this is, you know, Norwegian officials have told me this, I'm sure yeah. others, that the reason they ended up signing this joint statement uh, a couple of years ago, which essentially acknowledged that there is one China, although they didn't say they respected China's core interests, they didn't go quite that far, but they did use some language that I think was very supportive, and you could say maybe caved into China's pressure was because they couldn't talk with China about things that were really important on their agenda, including things like climate change. Uh, they couldn't get their ambassador in to have meetings with uh, officials in, in the Chinese foreign ministry. They couldn't have the, the, the FTA was talks were completely put on hold. That, those are now back on. And so I think really what's important is not only how they target specific products, which are, of course, designed to inflict pain on the target country. But it's also how they're combined with these other measures that sometimes these, it's these political and other measures that they use that are even more important. Mm -hmm. Okay, we'll take another question um, uh, from up here in the front. Thanks. And uh, Rachel Ziemba, adjunct here. And, um, I wanted. I was wondering how you think in this issue of mission creep, but also the examples, how the Chinese policy of non-intervention in other countries' foreign policy plays in. Now, this may be a down-the-line issue, but particularly where the Middle East is concerned, there are plenty of countries that are very upset that China hasn't taken a role, um, particularly in the GCC crisis and dispute. But I'm just wondering if if this non-intervention policy all kind of is is one of the other things that is a bit of um, uh, an offset just as China's role in creating the international financial architecture. Uh, I'm just wondering if this is something down the line that makes an issue. The purpose of the report in our com this conversation is about Chinese foreign policy goals. But as China is a greater part of quite a range of institutions, do you see issues in balancing that? Thanks. So my, my short answer to that is that China uh, has already begun to move away from a policy of non-intervention. We will see that further evolve. Sure. And just like we saw for a while the Chinese were sticking to, you know, Deng Xiaoping's, uh, you know, uh, principle of hide your capabilities and bide your time or however you'd like to translate that, uh, ultimately they stopped really yeah. using it even in, in, internally. Very rarely ever articulated by an official, but now sure. it's not even discussed internally except for maybe by one or two scholars. Unless so 
Right, unless it's useful for them. So my, my prediction is that eventually that this goes away. But um, the five principles, essentially, of peaceful coexistence, this remains important uh, to China occasionally in some context uh, to continue to articulate. Uh, but I don't think it is really a guiding principle of China's foreign, uh, foreign policy any longer. Dan. I would just add to that that I think, and again, this goes back to this notion of hypocritical power that I was talking about before, but one of the things, it's not just that U.S. hypocritical power is eroded, it's also midwifed to China the ability to articulate hypocritical power. So you have, on the one hand, Xi going to Davos and saying, we're going to be the defenders of the liberal international right. order, and then, you know, you have ZT and all the, the, the others, you know, and, and so I think in some ways the non-interference thing is, is going to be part and parcel of that, which is I don't think they're going to abandon it necessarily, and they'll use it for their interests. But in some ways, the very fact that China's economic coercion is largely informal allows them to simultaneously say one thing and, and do something else, and they're going to be able to get away with it for some time. Did you want to add anything? To that? No. Okay. Um, uh, another, did I have one in the back that was, uh, no? Uh, okay, uh, we'll come uh, up here to the gentleman in the sweater. Steve Jackson, Indiana University of Pennsylvania. This is for Dan Dresner. It's more of a comment uh, that I think we, uh, my own research in Sino-Japanese trade coercion uh, um, has demonstrated that the Chinese are a little less powerful than we think they are. Uh, of six boycott incidents that I tested empirically, only the 2012 one really statistically reduced China's imports of Japanese goods uh, um, during that period of time. And one of the other elements that works into your uh, point there is that Part of the informality is that China sometimes is afraid that the boycotts are just going to peter out. And indeed, my research showed that about three months after the main phase, oftentimes Chinese purchases of Japanese goods goes up to compensate for the uh, previous uh, reduction. So that they don't want this to be a formal boycott because what happens when you have a boycott and nobody boycotts, or at least not in the long term. Thank you. Boycotts are a great issue. We'll start, uh, yeah, we'll start with you, Dan. So I would say uh, two things on this. The first is that it's not shocking to me that the China's coercion of Japan is going to be less successful than China's coercion of others. Japan is a law, you know, it's, it's a great power in terms of an economy. It's got significant uh, resources. The, the question isn't so much China versus Japan. It's China v. Other countries that potentially might be more vulnerable. So again, this goes to the deterrent effect versus the coercive effect. But the second and more interesting question is going to be whether or not, as China continues to do this kind of thing, the extent to which China winds up engendering more corruption within its own economy. Um, which is to say, as you point out, there are going to be Chinese consumers and there's going to be Chinese firms that are going to want to try to find workarounds around whatever is actually being imposed. And to some extent, you saw that in some cases with rare earths and in some cases, as you say, with the Norwegian on the third party thing. It'll be interesting to see going forward, th there's an occasional mistake in sort of assuming China's economic statecraft is this monolith where they, they can completely command what, what all of their firms are doing. It, an interesting area of research is going to be when you start seeing you know, sort of forms of corruption that, that emerge if there are boycotts being announced or what have you, but then aren't actually honored necessarily. Peter, did you want to? Uh, yeah, I, I just would a echo what Dan uh, said. I would. I also think the Chinese are aware of this, right? I think they actually do look at what the impacts of the different cases have been, and I think that's why when you look at the South Korea case, for example, from just the last 18 months, I think they are beginning to think about what are readily substitutable products, right? I think they kind of understand that the Japanese, for example, may be offering certain kinds of products. I mean, cars are sort of readily substitutable, but some of the rest are not as readily substitutable. I think they are looking now for things that they would view as readily substitutable from a domestic industry or something in order to avoid uh, the problem you have. The other thing I'd, I'd, I'd just note, on, on boycotts, per se, boycotts, as you know, have a very long history, uh, you know, at least a century of history in China. And so this is actually something that ha they've been through various iterations of, not just in the last sort of seven or eight years, but going back uh, at least a century where they had a boycott against the United States. So I, I think we're going to continue to see this going forward. Okay, we're going to take um, about two more questions from the audience, and then I'm going to, uh, after that, give the panel a chance to wrap their last thoughts. <laughs>
terms of the way that it uh, organizes the private sector, even against the will of individual companies to stand up against these, these pressures. That is something that the Trump administration is somewhat signaling with the Section 301 investigation, with the, with the response to Taiwan. I think it's an, it could be the nub of an emerging strategy. The problem is, what is it connected to? There are going to be costs. Is the U.S. articulating what those costs are? Is it developing remedies to to address those costs? So I would I would frame that in the in this in the need to have really a coherent strategy. It doesn't need to be necessarily anything as broad as as the containment strategy that the U.S. used in the Cold War. But we do need to have a more uh, the U.S. government needs to have a more articulated and developed strategy in terms of how it is going to respond to this. What's, a, what's a, a coordinated Chinese system that, and, and that impacts not only these economic decisions, but also questions like the, the question raised about um, uh, Chinese freedom of discourse in, in academic settings in the U.S. So it's, I, I think that's the nub, I would put it as the nub of that challenge. How, do you, how does a uncoordinated democratic system respond to a more coordinated challenge on the, on the, on the Chinese side? Thank you. So we'll pivot here to last words from our panel. Please uh, tell us what you uh, wish you had said or what I didn't ask you. Uh, uh, what's the parting message for everyone here uh, or our homework going forward? I'm going to start with you, Michael, and come back down. People I think, have I, think I, I pretty much said it. That was, my, that was my right. sense okay. is the need to have a, a strategy. I mean, the other point is, is simply that, um, you know, China's system also continues to evolve very much. and. I think the degree of coordination and pushback, these will be things that, that China's system responds to. Um, in some ways, I think, as China grows more powerful economically, there's no question that it, it increases Beijing's leverage. But some of the same strategies actually, I think, become more of a liability because it makes clear to, to that many more players that reliance on dependence on China is, is a liability. So I think this is worth, this is very much an evolving picture and, and nothing that where we are right now is just a snapshot of what's going to be, I think, tensions within China's response to the West, but also tensions within China's system about how it, how it views these the costs and benefits of these tools. Um, I would just close by saying, I guess, two things. The first is to point out that it's not just China that's doing this now. Um, one of the more interesting things is that sanctions used to be largely the province of, of the United States and occasionally the European Union. Um, and, you know, acting multilaterally with the UN Security Council, but also certainly the UN. And one of the things you can argue that's happened over the last 10 years is that it's not just China throwing its economic weight around. Russia did this, you know, in terms of the, the New York fraud. You're seeing the GCC try to do this with Qatar. Um, and one of the things I wonder if you're going to start seeing going forward is, for lack of a better way of putting it, sanctions are going to be seen as a prestige good that great powers can use. And so as a result, you might see more countries employing sanctions not necessarily because they're going to work, but rather because that's apparently what they think great powers do. And therefore, by doing it, they can be seen as, you know, on a par with the China or the United States. Which means we're going to have a lot of dumb sanctions being imposed potentially over the next decade. I warn you about that. Um, the second thing, and related to that, is, is the degree to which I worry that as you see more of this kind of behavior going forward, you're going to see one of the interesting things, and I think this is particularly true on the Chinese side, is the degree to which they try to calibrate the sanctions such that they pressure particular companies but also avoid the sort of blowback in the form of economic nationalism. I thought the most interesting case that you talked about in the report, by the way, is the non case, the one where Vietnam responded, you know, to this economic pressure with there were genuine protests against Chinese companies where they set on fire, I can't remember or not. Like the, but there were like you know serious protests. The Chinese did not retaliate there. Um, and it was probably in their interest to not do that because they recognized that if you actually exercise the nationalism in a target country, it doesn't matter what the economic logic is at that point. The sanctions aren't going to work. Um, they're not going to generate the kind of concessions you want. And so going forward, you know, if we're literally, literally living in this area of, of, of populist nationalism, there's an increasing danger that even these more informal tools will trigger this kind of nationalist blowback. So I guess my closing thoughts would be uh, one that we, sh we should try to anticipate, if we can, things that China will do going forward. Uh, and I think this um, airlines case was predictable because uh, China is concerned about Tsai Ing-wen's policies. 
and they are looking for levers uh, over Taiwan. And to me, this was just uh, because of the vulnerability of democracies. These are companies that are not, and airlines that are essentially not uh, owned by the, by the state. Uh, that it was probably predictable that they would cave in. And the Marriott example, I think, also was one that suggested to China that this is an area where they have enormous leverage. Marriott's building what, what I think opening up a new hotel in China every week, yeah. if you include um, Macau and, uh, and Hong Kong. And I think they ran to the State Department and said, um, how do we apologize in, in, in how many ways, how strong, how do we, how do we, Set the, get this behind us. Uh, and the statement that they made of, of the apology was pretty strong. I think. Again, the China, that was the Chinese takeaway. Uh, I agree with the point about, uh, Michael's point about whole of government strategy, but ultimately I think we could ju just never have an effect, as effective a whole of government strategy as China's, uh, but we should, we should have one, uh, we should start. Uh, and th I guess my last point is, uh, it's a case that uh, is not in uh, in your uh, report, and it's and it's ongoing. Um, I like your mentioning of the Australia case because that's one to watch, particularly students. But what the Chinese are now doing against uh, Vietnam and also against the Philippines is they are using uh, various kinds of pressure to stop development of energy within these countries' exclusive economic zones. So these are rightful areas, according to Convention of the Law of the Sea. Uh, the, those resources belong exclusively to Vietnam and, uh, and, and to the Philippines. If we look in the case of Vietnam, uh, Repsol has shut down its, uh, its drilling activity there after sinking hundreds of millions of dollars. Um, and so this is also a, 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 an, an area where the United States has said nothing. And so where do we stand up under what circumstances? We have to figure out as a country how this fits into our overall strategy in dealing with the rise of China. So if we only call it out as Orwellian nonsense with an affects United Delta and American Airlines, that's not an effective policy or strategy in dealing with the rise of China. Peter, for the last word. I, I just, a uh, last word, I mean, I very much agree with the other panelists. I think we need a national strategy. China is going to be doing more of this. I mean, we've seen sort of pace of cases against countries and against individual companies increase, uh, you know, almost on a curve kind of uh, appearance, a nonlinear uh, fashion. And I think that's going to continue because, as, as the other panelists mentioned, from China's perspective, this has been successful. Well, we can argue whether the cases sort of empirically, externally, observably are successful, but even in the ones that are debatable, kind of empirically whether there's success, I think China has seen success out of these. So we're going to be doing more of it. Uh, they're going to be doing more of it. And I think uh, we do need uh, clearly some kind of national uh, strategy uh, to respond. I'd say it, it took us a number of years um, on the kind of what China does in terms of trade abuses to get to a point where as a country we've decided we're going to respond seriously to that. I think we are now with the Section 301 uh, and other issues. You can debate the merits of a lot of the specifics there, but we're clearly in a different world than we were a couple of years ago about responding forcefully to Chinese trade abuses. I suspect it'll take us at least as long uh, to get serious about a strategy uh, around Chinese uh, economic uh, coercion, um, but hopefully over the next couple of years we will get there. Thank you. Um, thank you very much for your remarks. I'm going to offer just a couple of other thank yous to close us out. Uh, I am grateful to the excellent hard work of the CNAS team, the events team that helped us put this on. And I want a particular uh, shout out to Eduardo, uh, who as our co-author and collaborator was a tremendous force in this work. Uh, and it was also in vitally important to the uh, getting on of this event today. So uh, thank you to all of you. And let me add my thanks, of course, to this panel for your excellent remarks. Let's uh, join me in thanking all of them with a round of applause.